just to get started? Absolutely. Well, thank you, okay. Shannon, so much, and good afternoon and happy fall. We're so pleased to debut the new season of Conversations from the Mesa. Thank you for joining the Mesa Verde Foundation. I serve on the board of directors and will be moderating today's talk, Preliminary Observations of Site and Structural Movements of Cliff Palace, a Scientific and Engineering Perspective, with William DuPont and James Mason. Both Bill and James will explore their cooperative work with the park. Cliff Palace in Mesa Verde National Park is a UNESCO World Heritage Cultural Site and is one of the few ancestral Pueblo and alcove dwelling sites that the public has guided access to. In recent years, on-site documentation conducted by NPS staff indicated Cliff Palace constructions may be moving downslope and out of the alcove in a slow creeping process. The conditions prompted MPS technical expert staff to investigate further. Last year in May, 2021, the National Park Service tasked the University of Texas at San Antonio Center for Cultural Society to collaborate on a four year program of research and investigation to support an engineering analysis of structural integrity. Before I welcome our presenters, I would like to thank the park superintendent, Casey Cook Collins, for her invaluable support. We are honored to have Casey as our November presenter. Her talk is titled, Giving Thanks to the National Parks, A Personal Story, in which Casey will discuss her family's legacy as Mesa Verde Park Superintendents. Our public programming is possible solely from donations and the support of Mesa Verde Foundation fellows and members like you. We thank you for creating space for this webinar offering. Now, circling back to our presenters, Bill DuPont is a fellow of the American Institute of Architects, Conservation Society of San Antonio, and professor at the University of Texas at San Antonio. Bill directs the University's Center for Cultural Sustainability that considers the heritage of people as a core element of a sustainable future. Williams' projects involve deep resilience, conservation of intangible heritage, condition assessment, feasibility, and master plans for historic sites. He teaches architectural design and historic preservation. Bill also leads a U.S. technical team supporting the preservation at Museo Ernest Hemingway in Havana. James Mason is a structural geotechnical preservation and seismic engineer and has more than 40 years of engineering experience that encompasses bridges, buildings, historic structures, geotechnical and bridge and building foundation engineering. He teaches and conducts research at several major universities. William has been employed with the National Park Service for seven years as an engineer. And I would now like to welcome Bill and James to the webinar. Thank you gentlemen for joining us. And uh, this is our first to have two presenters in one program. So thank you for making this possible. Absolutely. And Bill, why don't you start? Um, I will. Yeah, James, uh, you go ahead and get the screen up. And, uh, and I'm, we'll... I'm getting there. Something, yeah. something just happened to my computer. Okay. So uh, what you're going to hear about today is our research efforts in support of investigation, documentation, and assessment at Cliff Palace. Uh, and there's going to be uh, multiple parts to this. First, there'll be an introduction uh, to Cliff Palace that James will provide. And then I'll talk about project motivation and uh, also a, a information on the 20th century chronology, the changes that have happened uh, since the uh, 1909 uh, effort um, of, of stabilization and restoration by Fuchs. And then James will review our data collection uh, to, so you can see where we are in progress on issues of slope stability, uh, deformations and cracks, moisture and physical properties. And then we'll come back to me and, and give a quick little summary. Um, so we have a large team uh, for this and uh, they're not with us all today, but uh, I've got great colleagues. I'm the principal investigator. Um, oh, here we got James is sharing there. Great, James. 
so there's some team members on this slide. Uh, go to the next one, James, and this is the introductory uh, slide that shows the topics we'll be covering today, slide number two, if you can advance it. Yeah, that's what I just uh, talked about, our presentation agenda. And then go to slide number three, and here's our team, uh, Sarah and Anthony, our research fellows, Kelsey and Samir, our graduate students. Uh, Tracy's on staff and, and does a little bit of everything to hold things together. Uh, and uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Angela Lombardi and Dr. Blake Weisling are, are also on the team with us. We, we get a little support from our civil engineering department too from time to time. Um, and then of course, you know, this is a, a, a collaboration. So on the right side of the screen there, uh, you see James and, and his photograph and the wonderful staff at Mesa Verde uh, National Park. Uh, and, and we get support from the cultural resources team and the museum and archives team in a way that makes our work possible. And if it weren't for all of the efforts of, of past uh, excellent professionals at Mesa Verde doing their jobs, uh, we would have a very difficult time. We are, are in a way standing on their shoulders as we go forward uh, with our current investigation and research efforts. So uh, uh, James, if there's anything you wanna add about the team, uh, but uh, if, go ahead, but otherwise, why don't you launch right into the quick tour of Cliff Palace. Great, and I also wanna uh, just reconfirm the effort that it takes to do a project like this. Really, uh, there, there are so many people there at Mesa Verde, and then here I'm with the Vanishing Treasures program here in Santa Fe, and I just can't speak more highly of Bill and his team at the University of Texas in San Antonio. So it's a privilege to be able to share this information with you. Uh, what I wanna first do is go through and give to you an idea of the value of Cliff Palace in terms of it's the, the need for its preservation. I wanted to do this through uh, some photographs of areas that guests, visitors to Mesa Verde don't normally get to see. Here we are uh, standing up um, on the north end uh, near the Speaker Chief Tower area, and we're looking back south along the structure. Here's the walkway. This is where people normally walk. Some, some guests get to go up into this area, but most of the time people are constrained in terms of even getting up into the area where this photo is from. To the, to the right over here, this is called the Midden area, and it's a sacred place for the peoples that have lived there in Mesa Verde. One thing to understand uh, about an alcove site is its, its genesis. How did it become? How, what was the creation process for the alcove itself? So we have to remember that approximately 90 million years ago, an ocean extended from Alaska down into the Gulf of Mexico and across into the Carolinas. And, and the um, Cliff Palace uh, was at the edge of this oceanic area. And as we go up into Utah, that's where all the dinosaurs were. They were feeding off all the vegetation. And in, in, in terms of geologic process, that process was a bottom-up depositional process. So all the erosional materials that were coming off the Rocky Mountains were being deposited throughout this column of, of different materials. The uh, Cliff Palace and, and the areas of, around Mesa Verde are built up here in these upper sandstones, and there are areas that get down into this older material. But uh, we can see on the map, uh, here's Cliff Palace. It's in this main canyon uh, coming uh, through that, that part of the park. And the important thing here is to note that the sandstone that was deposited at the top is, is very, very lightly cemented. It's, it's very weak sandstone. So you had the deposition from the bottom up 
But then during the ice ages, it was all the runoff from the ice ages that created the uh, canyons that are throughout that area. And in the original depositions, you would get these areas where you would get sandbars and then you would get organics that would grow at these various levels. And then you would get deposition on top of that. And those, those organics are what provided the erosional boundaries, one of the erosional boundaries uh, that, that is found there in Mesa Verde, in particular here at Cliff Palace and at Spruce Tree House. <clears throat> I wanted to also put up this, this map just to give a general understanding of what we're gonna be talking about and the orientation of the structures uh, that we have. I was just, uh, that first photo, I was standing right in this area and the photograph was taken looking south. So this is the north end of, of the alcove. And then we come down to the south end with the kibas down here on the south, south end. Uh, and we'll be talking about all these different uh, kibas and such as we move along. So here's a, a photograph up from the observation deck looking back in to the alcove. Uh, some orientation, so, and we'll be talking about these different areas. This is the speaker chief house. Uh, and then we come down through all the, the main uh, kivas and Pueblo, uh, kivas and these towers, and the, this tower down here that Fuchs worked on. And at the very bottom, this is Kiva A, and as we work up BC, and they've all been delineated. There uh, were main plaza areas up in here. And one thing to keep in mind is as we look at these photographs, we have to remember that all of these kivas were covered with, with a structural roof. And people then, th th that whole area became a plaza and people would just congregate on top of these structures. So as you look around, just keep in mind that that used to be covered throughout. A lot of these structures also went up another couple stories a lot of them actually went up to the bottom of the roof of the alcove itself. So we, we need to step back into the uh, late 1800s and early 1900s to realize the extent of damage that was done to Cliff Palace, to Spruce Tree House, Balcony House, all these structures in that area, the Square Tower uh, were, were damaged. Uh, Cliff Palace in particular was heavily damaged. And, and it's just sad, you know, to see that people would break apart these structures. So all of this debris field down here was from structures that were actually standing there before they started destroying them. Here's another view of, of that from the north looking down south. And again, as I said, as um, uh, uh, anchors for where we're going to be looking, this is the Speaker Chief House. You can see this here. And again, down here on this tower, uh, and that was one of the main towers that Fuchs worked on. And showing those structures in their current state. Another um, area that just intrigues me and I just find fascinating and I wanted to share this is back in the northeast corner of the alcove, um, there, there, there's, there are these areas for these kivas. The speaker chief house is just back over to the left behind where I took this photograph. But I just love this view looking out across the canyon. And then also one thing that, that I wanna point out is if you see this horizon line right here, that's that uh, area of the sandstone and here you saw the formation of an alcove uh, in, in that zone also. But back a little bit further, it, they, there are these ancient structures that were built. And, and these were grain storage structures. Again, here's the speaker chief tower right here to the, to the left of the photograph. And the photograph I just showed, um, I was standing in front of this rock looking out along. But it, it's amazing to see uh, what was built by hand and uh, with intent, in this case, intent of 
preserving their food. Another area that I, I've just been just fascinated by is this overhead area up here. Now we have to remember that a lot of these structures were extending up high and the main entrance was this door opening right here. So you could get up through the structure on top of the roof and then come across in, in, into this uh, storage area. So this, this uh, has been thought to be uh, grain for grain storage, but then there's some really interesting features here with, with this overhead alcove, and that's this unreinforced stone wall. And I was asked uh, a while ago by um, Tim Hovazak, who at that time was uh, head of cultural resources, to go look at that. Uh, he had a, an intuition that that could have been used uh, for protection. Uh, if people had gotten into this area down underneath, that was one of the main uh, entries into the, into the site. Um, he was asking if this could be used to push out and come down on top of people. Uh, I, I got up here and uh, uh, sat there for almost an hour working through this structure stone by stone. Uh, and I finally found a, what's called a trigger stone. In other words, if you touch that stone, that would initiate a cascade of this panel of uh, dry laid stone. And here's a picture up inside. Uh, it's just inside the door. You can see this is the roof of the alcove. You can see how tight of a space it is. I, I, uh, I, I couldn't even get up on my hands and knees uh, to crawl through this. And then you come across, this light is coming from that area, uh, from that um, wall that I was just showing. Here we are back at uh, Kiva, um, you, if I remember correctly, but the point here is to, to show these uh, traditional tea doors. They're just the architecture unto itself is just amazing. And to think that, that this was all constructed, the tools that they had were sticks and stones. And that's how all this stuff got built. You can look around in many places and see pecking marks there's some light pecking marks I can see on this stone, these stones. So they would peck those stones with uh, sticks uh, to face off those stones as they built. This is that, uh, on, on the left side of this photograph, this is that main hallway that comes back. But what I, what I found absolutely fascinating was looking at this boulder, this large boulder here. This, this is part of the roof collapse coming off the top of the ceiling of the alcove. And the, the main walkway comes up here and then cuts back. But the, you, there are some light lines right here that you can see. And I've, I've blown it up a little bit more right here. And that's where they would sit and just grind their ax heads. Uh, and it, it just had to take hours, you know, to prepare those stones. So I just can, I can see people here hours upon hours. Of, of just being there and making their tools. Here's another view of, of that area and in, in this stone. And again, you can see the grooves that are right here. These little holes that are right there, that's where they would um, grind the tips on their, on their pecking sticks. Here, here's a small fire pit and, and you can go across. There was original pigment on the building behind. And one other thing I wanted to share was the tower towards the end of the site, just the graphics. So these are original paintings. These uh, uh, Vega timbers were framing for the uh, uh, flooring, which was a combination of latias, uh, uh, thinner twigs, and it was all mudded together as a unit. And uh, this was their main structural system. But I, I just try to visualize the graphics, just the beauty, the art of being in Cliff Palace when all these original paintings were, were all there. It, it just had to have been amazing. Um, I, I, I bring this slide up just for information as we go along. 
uh, and, and we'll talk about more at length. Um, and that is, there's been issues at, at Cliff Palace of water, groundwater seepage that has gotten into the Cliff Palace site at the back of the alcove. This would be up here in, in this back area. And it, it was extreme. It's very well documented. And people, they had to actually build sumps and sump pumps to move water out uh, through a hose system down through the north end here. I don't know exactly the path, but I knew it just came across this way. And the interesting thing was to help mitigate this water, they, they uh, hired some uh, miners to come in with uh, hand tools and dig this tunnel that goes back behind. It's 300 feet long. And, and this then became a drainage point for groundwater that was getting into the system. And here's, here's a photograph looking into the face of the tunnel, just right at the, at the beginning. So with that, I wanna go back over to Bill. Okay, thank you, James. So let's refocus on the project motivation, which is concerns regarding structural and slope stability and the necessity to ensure preservation and continued safe access. And so for the remainder of this presentation, uh, this is what you're gonna be uh, hearing about now that we've you know, set the stage and given you some information about what is Cliff Palace. Mm -hmm. So James, if you can go to the uh, next slide. So this is a uh, project that's done under what's called a cooperative ecosystem study unit. Many uh, National Park Service uh, people will know exactly what that means. And it's really a preservation engineering project. And it's an opportunity for us to work collaboratively with, with students and research faculty and National Park Service staff whenever these CESU projects are happening. We've done a num number of them for the National Park Service, including here in San Antonio, where I'm sitting at our, at our San Antonio Missions National Historical Park, which is actually how we got to know James uh, working on the Convento of Mission San Jose. And uh, the, these uh, projects, are really um, immersive and fully cooperative and collaborative. And that's important to remember because usually when you know, professional architects who would provide the sorts of services that uh, I and, and our team would offer um, get involved on a project like this, they, they work independently. And, and in this case, we, we effectively become one team. And that's why you're, you're seeing it here in this presentation. Part of the reason why James and I opted to go back and forth like we're doing uh, so that you get the flavor of how, how, this, how this thing works. So I'm gonna talk now a little bit about uh, the chronology. So go to the next uh, slide for me, James. Um, it's really important to, for us to understand the condition of the uh, stability of the masonry assemblies to know what's been done in the past. And there's been a lot done as I'm about to show you. Next one, James. So this just gives you a quick overview of, of 1908 versus uh, a, a picture we took last year. And uh, uh, my colleague, Sarah, drew uh, some lines here to help clue you in, uh, uh, find the features matching. And, and you can see the extent of work. Um, now, we often refer to a gentleman by his last name, Fuchs. Uh, Jesse Walter Fuchs uh, did a tremendous amount of work in 1909 in a very short period of time and really set the tone for exactly how Cliff Palace is visited and, and put all the walkways and, and made a lot of choices about what would, uh, how it would appear as it, as it does today. So the Fuchs period of change was one that was really important for us to understand the extent of. Uh, next one, James. With the, the help of, of Tara and Sam at the uh, uh, Mesa Verde archives and, and other uh, librarians at, at other archives, um, our, my colleague Anthony Vanette and, and Kelsey, a graduate student, spent many, many hours going through all of the papers and looking at different And uh, it's very difficult to, to master all of it, um, but we've, we've tried to pull it all together so that we could have it in one a chronological development document, which is actually still in progress. We, we hope to have it done over the next few months. Uh, next slide, please, James. So this one's gonna have some animation, this slide, and uh, 
Uh, what you're going to see here is zooming in on, on a section that we studied uh, in order to perfect a, a method of showing the change over time graphically for people to understand it uh, very quickly. So zoom in, James, with the click. So we're going to look at this particular area, which is centered on Kiva C. Go ahead and click, James, and I think it'll show the Kivas. And these Kivas, the, this uh, notation system of, of Kiva E, C, F, D, B, this, this comes from uh, uh, various individuals of, like uh, uh, Gustav Nordenskold, who was in from Stockholm in the 1890s, was the first person to document um, drawings of Cliff Palace, and then uh, Jesse Walter Fuchs, and then, then other researchers over time who labeled and developed nomenclature of, of all of the ways that uh, the features are identified. And we're just following along uh, as we do that research. Uh, so this shows uh, where those kivas are located, and you can really see the extent of, of work that Jesse Fuchs did in 1909. Uh, go ahead, next slide. So the, here's a uh, information that just indicates where Fuchs worked uh, on that effort. Uh, and uh, he did a lot of work on, on all the tops. Most of the capstones around the kivas are his. He, he rebuilt that tower, which subsequent, subsequently got rebuilt, and, and many spot areas and did lots of you know, uh, uh, outer walls are, are where the visitors uh, walk along the paths. Those are all from the, the Fuchs uh, era. The next one, James. And then uh, Earl Morris and Al Lancaster did a tremendous amount of work over the decades in the 1930s uh, up until uh, 1963. And just looking at this same area, this is showing the places uh, which we refer to as the Lancaster period, or you know, Morris was part of that too. And many people worked on this, but we, we um, tend to just put the name of the leader in. Uh, and then in the, in the full report, there's a lot more information. Uh, but this shows you where, where Lancaster did his work. Next one, James. And then you can see as, as the years go by, there's less work being done because people develop a lighter touch and they're focusing on, on just doing spot stabilization. And so the, the efforts uh, tend to be a, a little less uh, invasive except where necessary. And so in these Decker and Crawford years in the 60s, 70s, and up to 1982, this particular area um, had just these few changes. Next one, please, James. And then uh, this is uh, Kathy Fierro and, and some post Fierro years. And you can start to see that there's certain areas that, that keep getting uh, attention that are problem areas. And this is important for, for us to see and for James to know about as the structural engineer so that we can tell him, hey, these areas continue to be problem areas. We got a trouble spot here. Um, and so that's what this chronological development can really, really help us with. Uh, next one, James. And then here's the composite of all those changes. And so when you look at them, you can see where Kiva C has, has really had a lot of uh, necessity for attention over the years uh, like compared to Kiva F, uh, which hasn't needed as much uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, mortar repointing. Um, and uh, uh, so th that's what we use the chronological development for. We've now, uh, Anthony uh, Vinette has, has made maps. Uh, there's five different sectors that we've made maps of. This is just one sector. And we have all five of those uh, almost ready to go. Um, so that's great. Uh, next one, please, James. Let's see where we're at here. Okay, we're going to go back to you now, James, for the data collection set. Great. So you can get an overview and just a sense of the complexity of this site and all the structures. And the big picture uh, really requires us drilling in and understanding in great detail what's happening in terms of the materials, as Bill was saying, what was reconstructed. Uh, there are all sorts of different mortars that have been used on site. We, we're using non-destructive techniques to go in and, and test all these things. And I've, I've been looking at and working on Cliff Palace as well as Spruce Tree House up at Mesa Verde uh, since I initially started with the Park Service. Um, a little over seven years ago now. And I bring to this 
discussion, the combination of structural engineering and geotechnical engineering and the preservation engineering part really incorporates uh, ar archaic materials and understanding how those archaic materials interact with one another. But most importantly is starting with the foundation system, whether it be on flat ground or on a slope. So I wanna talk about slope stability first because per my assessment, this is the main driving force for issues that are occurring in Cliff Palace. We have both these global large site issues like slope stability, and then we have more local issues where we have pressure from structures up above a particular kiva uh, that are pushing down, and that earth pressure develops a lateral earth pressure that pushes on the walls and is causing problems. And I'll go through all these bits and pieces, but I wanna start with this uh, whole thing of slope stability analysis. And, and this is a typical um, slip surface for a, a, a site where you're pushing on the top and, and this mass of soil is slipping along this curve line and it typically daylights out here at what is called the toe. And, and this is fully developed in terms of understanding this sort of stuff. Uh, but what I wanted to do is provide more graphics to you so that you can get an idea of what a failing slope really looks like. So here's a special kind of clay uh, that's used for modeling in geotechnical analysis. And what was happening here was a pressure was applied on top of this area and the subsequent failure surfaces you can see in, in these areas where it's actually sheared and you can see how those shear zones develop. You can also see as you follow this figure around these, these deformations of how there was this push that was coming down and deforming the soil underneath also. And there's this associated uplift down here in this toe area. And I've seen this sort of uh, failure phenomenon numerous times in the field. And you learn to look for cracks out here in the soil, look for these slip surfaces, you look for cracks back up on top. And, and I, I think that's what's happening out in front of the uh, site down in the midden area. So here in this slide, you can see we, what we did was we approximated the ground surface profile along this line. And then we projected that back to show you what it is over here in, as constructed now. But again, the, the, the issue that I'm really concerned about is the slope failures that begin up here. So here's the weight of these structures pushing, pushing down and you have these slip surfaces um, that are developing underneath and bulging. And I think I'm concerned, I see bulge in this area and, and that's, it's subtle, but it's enough to tell me that that could very well be that bulge that I was just showing to you. Back in the um, 60s, uh, early 60s, there was a, a large scale study that was done by an engineering firm looking at the geotechnical aspects of uh, the area along the walkway and also doing some work down in the midden areas. And this slide is a composite of several graphics that they presented. So let's, let's look over here at this left figure and then we'll come across and, and look at the right figure. So they were able to go in and plot, this is plotted to scale. This, this plot was taken about mid section of, of the full site. And what the, what's happening is that they were plotting, they were finding the what top of rock, what we call top of rock, but that 
changes material throughout. And then they were plotting the structures on top of it. So you can see the, there are these areas that have material that was brought in. Now we have to remember that these sites and these types of structures are what are called a bottom up construction. In other words, they level off an area and then they start to build on top of that leveled area and bring it up. Sometimes here at Mesa Verde, uh, they were able to uh, uh, found some of those uh, buildings, towers and such directly on rock. And the majority of the structures there in Cliff Palace are built on loosely placed sand. And for the sake, uh, uh, for the case of um, kivas, they would necessarily build up the kiva walls and then they would have to backfill up against that and bring the fill level up against the top of, of the kiva itself. The other thing that this uh, Dames and Moore group did was they dug some trenches down in the midden area and they were looking at what was happening, what kind of materials are down there. And, and here they are plotting this for these various locations. So here's trench one, and here's a top view of trench one. Here's trench two, a side a section view elevation. Here's trench two and three, and then there's a trench four. Uh, these are contour lines that are coming around at one foot contours. And the, the general idea, first of all, is seeing the, the slope that comes along and then what's happening for the materials. So uh, the, these hash marks were their estimation of a rock surface, either sandstone or shale. And then uh, there would be, in this case, there's some material that was placed. And then here uh, that is a layer and wrongly, they called this Cliff Palace trash. And this is really the midden area where the ancients, ancient Pueblans placed uh, refuse, uh, um, uh, you know, their, their broken pottery, uh, you know, fecal matter, all, the, all those things that go with living in a location were placed directly on top of this pile out here as you come around. And then ultimately it was backfilled with a, a cover layer, a capping layer, uh, over, over the whole area. This, this also comes out of that report, and there are a couple important things here that I wanted to present. So uh, not only did they dig the trenches, but they also went in and took some what are called soil borings, where they bring in a machine that can uh, uh, push down a <clears throat> two-inch diameter tube into the soil. They did this at two locations. One is here and one is here at the north end. And then these soil profiles are plotted over in, in the diagram in this elevation view. That, that's what's happening here. So we do have some information, but this site in particular, there's something really interesting that's happening here, and I'll show you in the next slide. And there's a, a, a major change of, of elevation and gradient uh, just outside of the area that we're seeing here. The other important piece of information here is this limits of the cave overhang. And, and the, way that, the reason why this is important is that this is the drip line for the waters that are draining off the top of the alcove and they would come down, hit this edge, and then drip down. And when they got down in this area, they were dripping directly onto the kivas and other structures. Now, when, when this was originally built, remember those sites were covered, those kivas were covered. So they were shielded from water accumulating in the kivas. But after you know, the 1900s, th those roofs were removed and since then, water has been dripping directly into the kiva, and we'll talk about that some more. Now, this is the slide that um, that we've uh, I've just been investigating, and 
I was looking at a Google Earth image of, of, of the site, and I noted that there was this uh, a V-shaped groove down in the rock mass down near the canyon floor. And I, I, I recognized that as an erosional structure, but I was curious, you know, why would that be occurring? And, and then um, I went and I got the topo map and I plotted the uh, center line, this gradient line that comes up through along, along the, the site itself. And what, what's interesting to note is that um, this center line, as it comes up top, it points directly up at Speaker Chief House, which is fascinating because it just adds to the evidence that there's this gouge in, in this basal rock. But so here's, here's I think, the, the gouge as it comes up. Here's Speaker Chief House, it's pointing directly to it. And, and here I have a series of photographs uh, from the 30s where uh, there was this big piece of boulder that had fallen off the ceiling of the alcove site. And S Speaker Chief House is right here. Uh, this is what the deck area right here. And then the main housing structure is right behind it. But this splitting right here of the rock, uh, that means that this rock is in bending. So it, I, I, expect, I suspect that it is draping across the gouge. So in the 30s, they realized they had to fix this. So they went back in and cleaned out underneath this big stone. They built a stone uh, concrete column to support the stone. And then after that, they came back in and built in a masonry wall to close off the area and provide some additional support. And then when you look over here at uh, uh, view F, uh, this is the finished structure, and the wall that I'm talking about is built in here, and they left an ac access portal over here to check in on, on the site. Um, going back to the slope stability problem, this is up just above the uh, visitor's walkway right here, and so this slide area would be towing out in, in this region. Now, what's interesting is back on the slide where I showed the cross section with, with the step features of, of, the, of the site, um, it, I was projecting soil, soil angles. So soil has a natural uh, response to gravity. That's called the angle of repose. And for materials like this, that means that the soil itself would form a pile. If you just poured it into a pile, it would form a natural conical shape. And the angle, that bottom angle, would be somewhere around 30 degrees, uh, maybe even less for this kind of soil. Well, when you go back and look at the, at the surface plots and the measurements that were done, this area, the slope is 5, 10, 15 degrees steeper than what would naturally develop at, at a site like this, which tells us that this area, the slope itself, is staying in place because of the root structure of the trees that, that uh, uh, bind everything together. If those trees go, definitely the slope will go, and it would be this cascading event up into the structure. Now, in terms of doing um, structural engineering, I've trained myself to uh, learn how to read cracks and, and use those cracks to inform me of issues, where the issues uh, uh, initiate. Uh, there's a graphical analysis that I've developed for this. And, and it tells me also what, what's moving where. And I wanna go through a couple slides that show these kinds of things and, and that'll help bring things together for you. Uh, these are some photos over here up in the upper left-hand corner. That This is uh, out of Lancaster's notebook. Here's Lancaster and uh, they're up in Kiva O and here are these cracks that are developing. Now, what's interesting is that 
these cracks, they, they, they're coming up, but then they start bending over in this direction. This direction's the downslope side. So what, what, what's happening here, and as you go through, you'll see in all these slides, these are a series of photographs of the same crack. And we come over here, here's that same crack. And, and the one adjacent to it, this whole outer wall is moving, but it's not moving laterally in, in mass, it's rotating about the toe. So this thing is, is rotating, which then leads to, well, what's happening with the foundation? Why isn't the foundation holding this up? You know, and, and then it just brings up this cascade of questions of the earth pressure of structures up above pushing on the kivas down below and causing deformation in those kivas. This slide is one of those cases. This is Kiva O. And what you're seeing here is a, a couple interesting things. You're seeing this, this bending that's going on in this area. And, and, and that's visible because of these tangent lines that I've drawn on the wall face. So this, this upper one, was tangent through those two stones and it extends out. This one over here is tangent to this, this uh, stone here, Kiba O, and extends out. So this is the degree of rotation that's happening in this wall. And, and you can make that out. You see this part right here. Well, the wall, the curvature is coming into the Kiba and it's being developed because of all the earth pressure from up above, pushing on, on the kiva. It, if the kiva was just in soil by itself on a horizontal surface, all that lateral earth pressure would be pushing inward on, on that cylindrical shape, which forms a perfect uh, structure. In this case, there's uh, you know the, the walls down below, out over here, that can't provide any resistance to, to the system. It, this wall right here is the wall down here that we're looking at. The other part that's happening that really uh, is of concern are is how the wall is moving outward relative to the to the foundation stones. So these have the benefit of the soil within the structure providing restraining the wall from moving. But then as you get up further in the wall, th that restraint doesn't carry up. The mortars are not strong enough to resist the earth pressure behind. So now you've got the wall leaning out in a way and, and displacing uh, the, you know, some distance uh, relative to the foundation. As you come around and look at these things, you can start to see you know, these, these, the movement of the wall as it's going this way, opening up these cracks. We were just looking in the prior slide for the cracks right here. That's this whole wall is rotating outward, right? And, 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 and it just goes through all these motions. That, here's um, Kiva I, and just this is just another example. And then documentation, people over time, have been rigorously spending hours here within the site uh, measuring and documenting all these cracks. Now, part of the problem that comes up is that you, a crack develops in a wall, but then the crews go back in and fill those cracks. And sometimes you lose fact of the uh, cracks were there, they've been covered over. Another part that we're doing that we've done is that we've gone in, and this is extremely high tech. There's a device called a LIDAR scanner. And this is a laser scanner that can go in and measure very accurately the position of all these features that you wanna scan. Here at Cliff Palace, we did every room, every Kiva, and even the complete overhead. And what's really wonderful about this is that later on, we can use that as a database to measure against. And here, we're just showing some of the crack patterns that are occurring on these walls. And here are some of these kivas. 
The other thing that we're doing is looking at the effect of moisture on the walls and, and how that uh, causes all sorts of problems. Uh, so the moisture from the top of the alcove uh, drips down, comes and hits this edge, and, and then falls down. I've, I've stood right here in, on site during these massive rainstorms, and I'm completely protected right here while it's pouring rain uh, all along this area. Now, the problem is that that rain is falling into those upper kivas, saturating the ground uh, all around them. It's also going in and eroding out mortar beds uh, uh, on the various structures. So um, uh, Angela has been going through and mapping out the, uh, the moisture, where it's occurring, uh, mapping out what's called efflorescence. Efflorescence is uh, seepage coming from the groundwater, uh, groundwater moving through the wall section and, and leaching out the salts from within the stones and mortar, and then they uh, dry out on the surface of the stone. Then there's another type of damage that's done with the water, and that's called runneling. And that's where you have uh, water that's dripping down and either through erosion or its, its transport, uh, you get these surface deposits of, of muds and silts. And then here, we're also looking again at the drainage and how the water is affecting uh, all these structures on site. And as we look around, water is one of the main damage, damaging mechanisms that, that's hurting, hurting the site. Okay, I wanna move over to this next part and get through a couple more slides. Um, I, I see we're going sort of short on time. One of the things that we're doing here, uh, two, two of the team members, um, Sarah um, and Angela Lombardi, Sarah Himeno, they're, they're both from Europe. Sarah's uh, from Spain, uh, Angela is from Rome. She's there right now. And they've been bringing new methods and techniques to us that the American engineering community just aren't very familiar with, if they're familiar at all. It's, it's lack of reading European literature. In, in Europe, they developed a system of trying to, uh, uh, they developed the system of quantifying material properties based on various parameters that they can see and measure in a wall section. And those parameters are listed over here. Uh, you know, the, the type of stone, the dimensions of the stone, the shape. Uh, a term from Europe is wall leaf. That's the exterior uh, 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 components of the walls. Uh, here, people say the white. Um, the bedding joints, horizontal bedding joints, and then the stagger for the vertical joints, and then the mortar properties. All of these are given quantification. In other words, they give a scale and they get put into this equation. And then this then gives them a value. And they've been back calculating the strength of various walls, both in the lab and in situ, to give a quantification of the structural strength of the wall based on the geometrics that we see. And this table, I, I just don't want to go through the whole thing, but by and large down here in the uh, bottom left-hand corner, you can come up with a rating of the masonry being good, average, or inadequate. And then you can get into strengths and all these things. So we're going to be using this information to move over into our engineering analysis, which is going to incorporate the geometrics from the LIDAR with the physical properties from the MQI method. And we're gonna bring that into this type of analysis. Uh, the, some people use uh, finite element. 
we're going to be using a program which uh, is called FLAC 3D and also um, three deck, three three dimensional uh, um, element uh, analysis. And the, the beauty of this is that this program set up so that we can do both the structural analysis sitting directly on top of the soil profile so that we have a complete understanding, the holistic system uh, coming together as a unit. And here we're showing just one PIVA, but we're right in the initial stages of these models. And we're gonna do test runs numerically to validate our our methodology, but ultimately we're gonna be going in and doing the, the site and looking at the interaction of all these components of, of the all the buildings and the kivas at, working together as a unit. Okay, thank you, James, that was great. So in summation, I just wanna bring it back to the people and, and mention we had a lot of UTSA students there in July, and, and they learned a tremendous amount. And, and this uh, you know, collaboration includes also the cultural resources team at Mesa Verde, uh, Lizzie and, and Kay and Chris. And so there's a lot of people involved in this. You know, James and I are doing the talking right now, but there's many players. And so this little chart here, just to wrap things up, uh, is a way that we use to keep track of all the different things we're, we're trying to uh, monitor and test. And so the symptoms are cracks and deformations or steep slopes, slope stability, or moisture. But then there are potential problems associated with those symptoms, and then questions to be answered, and then the various ways that we can collect data or monitor or test uh, by uh, types of diagnosis. And, and so this is just to show you like all the different moving parts that we have to keep track of as we coordinate our activities uh, to go forward together in, in solving this very complex problem. And it, it's really exciting for us and, and it's a great honor to be working on it. So uh, I think uh, we can maybe go to Q&A now, James, and uh, uh, maybe field some questions. We're at the one hour mark, it looks like. <laughs> Well, thank you both for just such a compelling presentation and your slideshow was wonderful. The graphics, the historic photos and uh, your contemporary images and just uh, so much appreciation. We're going to open this up now to questions and comments. Uh, we have a question from David Burns. What can be stated about the stability of the ground directly below the palace? I assume it could be slipping too. Yes. Um, so yeah, David, um, in, in the parlance of geotechnical engineering, those were all unconsolidated materials. So what that means is that people were just taking buckets of sand and pouring it down without any compaction and then building the structures on top of it. So you're exactly correct. Uh, there's consolidation that's been going on, just that the natural process uh, of, of compacting loose materials. Okay, and it looked like uh, Chris Barnes had two questions. Uh, Chris, I don't see them in the chat box. So while you're typing, we'll move on to Bob O'Brien. Is it likely that the issues can be mitigated to prevent failure of the site? Um, yes, it, it, that, that, yes, the answer is yes. And so um, my mentor for preservation engineering was a gentleman by the name of Dr. Fernando Lizzi, uh, Italian who retrofit 60 of the most famous buildings in Italy. And I've been using that technology, designing with it for years now. Uh, almost 30. And I, he was my mentor. I spoke with him many times, uh, getting into deep philosophical questions. And then when I was at Cornell as a graduate student, I studied this also at length and it had in-depth conversations 
with my professors there. So it's a, it's a very, very effective system um, with very little interaction with the site and structures. You won't see anything if we go that route. Look, just let me say this, first of all. We, you know, part of engineering is to ask the hard questions, right? What if, or what if this area uh, uh, degrades? What about these kinds of materials? And, and you, you don't necessarily have the answer, right? You're, you use these tools to provide some level of, of understanding of the mechanisms. And then, then you need to come in and ask questions about risk and all these other things that come into doing engineering. So just realize we're not committed to a solution. What we're committed to is analyzing this and coming to a rational understanding of what we see now. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that answer. Um, we have a question from Chris Barnes. He says, the promo for this talk said you were looking at the 15th century walls. Typo. Was that a typo? Yes, 13th century. <laughs> Good call, Chris. <laughs> Well, you guys are certainly time travelers just going to, uh, you know, the archaic to uh, prehistoric to now. So it's hard to keep these centuries in order. Um, so we have a question from Nancy Nyberg. Was the historic north end drainage pipe created for rainwater or seepage or both? Yeah, all right. Is Nancy referring to uh, the water that I was talking about the in the back of the alcove? That's my the assumption. The 1960 oh, tunnel. Oh, the tunnel itself. Maybe. Well, you want me to read Bill, that to you again? Sure. Maybe, Bill, why don't you, you can answer this question there. Okay. Was a historic <laughs> north end drainage pipe created for rainwater or seepage? Or both. Yeah, at the, at the northern end of the site, there's the tunnel that, that James showed in his map, and, and that is to pick up a seepage that was uh, coming between the, the uh, elements of the rocks where uh, the water can find its way through, and mm -hmm. it was reported to have been immediately effective by the people in that time period, that it did pick up the water and channel it away. Um, so it was in response to moisture that was observed moving through the northern end of, of the Cliff Palace site. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, and just to add to that, Monica, Bill's <laughs> got it. Um, just realize any rock mass, if it was rock that was continuous forever, right, water would essentially not get through it. I mean, there's varying degrees. Now, this sandstone is fairly porous, just to let people know. But still, there are what are called joint sets that are created in, in the rock structure itself. So if we look at, uh, let me see if I can find a picture of this. If we look back at the roof of the alcove, yeah, right here. Uh, let me see if I can bring that over. Can you see that side? Do you get to see the structure itself? I don't see anything on my end. Okay, hold it's on. on the Q and A slide. There we go. Okay, no, I don't. Uh, let me go back. You just had it. <laughs> no, I, 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 let me go back. Gentlemen, we're getting there. It's not real clear. Because actually, this is critical, and, and this is the thing, you know, that we're dealing with at Spruce Tree House also, is this very issue um, of the crack in, in, in the structure. So, see this crack right here? Now, there, there are others, like there's one back over here, and there are others 
And what's happening is that the water at the top of the alcove gets and drains down through these cracks. And, and that's the main transport mechanism for surface water to get down into the alcove itself, or these, these what are called joints. It, it, it's interesting because this crack, see when it was originally um, um, deposited, this was a continuous surface. And, and going back to the gentleman's question about um, uh, settlement, consolidation, down in the soil profile, there is an area of shale and the um, weight of all the sandstone up above caused there to be settlement in that shale layer. And it's with that settlement that it initiated this crack. So understanding the ge geologic, the mechanisms for all these bits and pieces, uh, it, it's, it's just absolutely imperative that you get down to that level of detail. Well, well, thank you for going back to show us with that great photo. Um, either you or Bill, we have a question from Seth Bradley. How has infrared techniques helped your research? Yeah, go, Bill. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, we use a, a simple infrared camera to read the surface temperature of the stone. Um, I've taken uh, many photographs with our, our FLIR uh, camera, and I've trained the students in how to use it, too. Uh, to date, it, it hasn't produced any findings that we weren't able to also observe with our eyes uh, just by visual observation. Um, but it's a it's a nice confirmation, and uh, uh, it it helps to clarify the extent of of moisture damage. But we can see in the in the nature of the stones and the washout of the mortar and repeated uh, repair areas exactly uh, where moisture is is dwelling and causing problems. And so we're we're making use of the infrared camera, but thus far it hasn't added to our knowledge uh, in a way that uh, um, you know we weren't already seeing with our eyes. Okay, wonderful. And we have a question from Robert Coom. Is there any evidence of catastrophic failures of the structures in the distant past? Gosh, uh, I'm not aware of any. Yeah, right. The um, out, outside of the damage that was done by the pot hunters, um, the, I, I I can say this: having it worked on masonry structures around the world, what I see how the ancient Pueblans built what they built and their tools, these people were absolutely genius and they were master masons. And uh, it, it just is incredible to see the quality of the work that they produced. Yeah. Okay, and well, thank you for those comments, um, James. I really appreciated when you spoke about the overhead storage area where when you were sitting there for a while, you saw the trigger stone that would release it all <laughs> to whoever is yeah. coming up from below. So that goes into just the, the technologies they had at the time. You know, our technology is different in modern times, however, doesn't make it any superior. That's right. And um, let's see, this is, um, this was a comment from, Christine McAllister to um, Robert Coombe, who just asked that question about the catastrophic structure. Um, there is a large alcove just north of Cliff Palace um, where a large alcove spall destroyed a kiva that was in the process of construction. We have seen collapse in many of our alcoves, but it usually seems to have occurred after abandonment. That one happened during occupation. Well, Christine, thank you. I'm very familiar and so are our viewers of the work Christine McAllister does at the park. We've had her on two times with this webinar series. So 
Thank you. There was one other question. I'm just going through the chat box. Um, another question from Bob O'Brien. How do you balance out the needs for preservation and mitigation as well as cultural protection? That's the million dollar question, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and that, uh, that is a team answer. The and process I'm, and a team answer. It, yeah, right. And I'm not the one, I'm part of that process. So Bill and I are providing a very rational understanding of the risk here. And there are risks that I really haven't gone into detail about, but there are risks that need to be addressed. And we're in process of those sorts of conversations. So it's it um, and again, you know, it, it's it's team. It's uh, you know, it's Casey, uh, it's Lizzie Dickey, head of cultural resources, Superintendent uh, Cook, Casey Cook, you know, uh, uh, Assistant uh, Superintendent Bill Melligan, all the people. You know, I, we we could just go on and on. You know, uh, how many people are involved in that? And then Bill and his team are going to be directly involved in helping provide answers, you know, when we get together. Well, that sounds like it would make another wonderful webinar, the risk involved. And yeah. that's a whole topic onto itself. And Nancy Nyberg, who left a question earlier in the chat box, she already wants you to back to discuss spruce tree house issues. <laughs> 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 okay, okay, and so for people that don't know, I, I'm also the engineer of record for Spruce Tree House Alcove site. And uh, um, when I, that was actually the first thing I saw and was uh, um, uh, uh, told, go analyze this, right? And when I realized in great detail through a lot of hand calculations, a lot of research that there's there is a substantial risk there uh, that we um, didn't want to take that risk, so that's why we shut it down. Hmm. And we're, we've gone through and done a very rigorous analysis of that site and come up with a solution. So it, it's it's in consultation right now, hmm. and. Uh, we're we're waiting for those conversations. So it's not a done deal, and and uh, a lot of people are involved with that conversation. Well, thank you. We have one last question before we conclude today's webinar. This question is from Kristen Fox. Can you talk about the tribal consultation process and how native stakeholders are involved in determining the methods of protection for the site? So why don't you start on that one? Well, I teach preservation law and, and, and the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. And uh, there, there are specific federal laws that the National Park Service, of course, follows and many policies and procedures. And uh, the, the question in, in, in detail would probably be best answered by you know, the a superintendent of a park or, or somebody uh, you know, who's involved in these consultation processes uh, you know with the with that past experience there there might be others on this call still who you know know better how to answer this question than, than I do but it does follow a very rigorous and quite specific uh, process in order to make sure that uh, everyone's voices are heard well well thank you bill for for answering that um i think that concludes uh today's event if you and james have any final words um go ahead now otherwise we're just getting all wonderful compliments of thanking you for this presentation Bill, would you like to say something it was a pleasure uh it's an honor to work on this project uh I'm, i and the team at utsa are, are privileged to assist the national park service yeah, and and I also want to acknowledge all the tribal input and cooperation that goes into this sort of project. 
and I, I uh, want to convey to people the sincere uh, concern and effort uh, from the NPS side to do what's right and work with all the tribal groups uh, for making this a solution to an extremely important uh, uh, cultural heritage. All right. Well, well, thank you, James. I'm already looking forward to roping you both into <laughs> a second <laughs> webinar. I think our, our participants agree. And uh, Shannon, I'll let you take it away. I just want to say thank you to both of you for today's um, presentation. It was fabulous. And I think the participation from our audience um, directly demonstrates that. And then I also want to say thank you to Monica um, for always being such a wonderful moderator for our webinar series. And thank you to everyone who attended today. Please know that you will receive a link to a recording of this webinar. Um, and in the meantime, if you want to go back and watch any of our old webinars, um, you can find them on our YouTube channel by searching Mesa Verde Foundation. Thanks so much. We'll look forward to having all of you back here next month for Casey Cook Collins's webinar about um, appreciation and the National Park Service. It'll be perfectly in line with Thanksgiving. So we look forward to having you then. Thank you, everyone. Bye.